Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our regular webinars here at IBM Research, where we share with the world, with you guys watching us right now, all our latest uh, milestones, breakthroughs, discoveries. I'm Katya Moskovich, the editorial lead of IBM Research. And as usual, I am here at IBM Research Lab in Zurich, Switzerland. The topic today is quite exciting and also I would say quite important, right, for, for many of us, it's energy. I don't think uh, there are many people uh, out there who don't care about energy, about energy storage, energy production, the cost of energy and so on. I mean, think about it, right? Like if you're a kid, um, of course you would care about your, I don't know, uh, remotely controlled car uh, to last longer, right? It's like you don't wanna just keep running to your parents begging for new batteries. And if you're an adult, then you probably, to some, like many of us care about sustainability, using renewable energy, which means better energy storage solutions, of course. Um, and we all care about the cost of electricity, cost of energy. So energy for many of us is quite a crucial, crucial topic right now. And this is exactly where uh, quantum computing, this super awesome next generation technology uh, inspired by nature, can really, really help. And of course, you know, next to me, I have uh, a model of a quantum computer, and I hope that at least some of you uh, have, you know, watched our previous webinars on quantum computing, where we explain uh, quite in detail what quantum computers actually do. If you haven't, then please do go back uh, to our earlier webinars, especially the one uh, I did in February with. Uh, uh, my colleague here in Zurich, our quantum lead, uh, Heike Riel, she's amazing and she explains really, really well and in great detail how this amazing machine actually works. So do go back and watch, but but not now, of course, uh, do keep watching us right now uh, for another hour. Uh, and we are um, also going to be talking about AI, artificial intelligence, so how quantum and AI can help us build the next generation battery of the future. Uh, before we go to our two presenters here, though, uh, let me remind uh, all our viewers to please send us our uh, your questions in the YouTube chat, because behind the scenes, we've got an amazing team of scientists who will be answering your questions in real time. A lot of the questions we will also answer live, of course. Uh, they will be sent to me, and I will be then asking our uh, presenters. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce our amazing uh, presenters today, all the way from California, joining us, Gavin Jones, a chemist who uses quantum computers to run molecular simulations. And we will talk about what exactly that means more in detail during the, during the show, and Gavin will tell you all about it. And here in Zurich, joining us, um, computational chemist Theo Leno, who has been um, looking into creating better batteries for electric cars for a few years now. Today, he's actually working on accelerating the discovery of new materials, including materials for energy applications. Welcome, guys. Thank you for joining us here today. Ciao, ciao, Katia, and uh, <laughs> good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everybody. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thanks for, for joining us. So uh, the first question, from me is for you, Gavin. And again, just to encourage our viewers here to start sending questions in the chat. But the first question is going to be from me. Please tell us what is actually this connection between quantum computing and batteries in a nutshell? Like if you can just explain what quantum specifically, how quantum specifically could help with battery applications. Uh, sure. Um, well, I'll talk briefly about quantum computing since there may, may be viewers who are not familiar with quantum computing. Um, then I'll talk about quantum computing and chemistry, and then specifically uh, batteries. Um, so quantum computing is a new form of computing in which instead of using bits comprising zero or one as a basic element of computation, we use qubits, which comprise superpositions of zero and one, meaning that it's a combination of zero and one at the same time. And the significance of this is that you can potentially represent more states with a quantum computer than you can with a classical computer. Uh, one other useful property of quantum computing besides superposition is entanglement, in which qubits interact in a way such that the quantum state of each qubit cannot be described independently of the others, 
even when separated by a large distance, which means that whatever is done to one qubit happens to the other qubit. So this is one of the fundamental differences between a classical computer like your laptop or a supercomputer, for example, and a quantum computer. Uh, we also use quantum logic gates in quantum computing that are similar to classical logic gates, like the AND or NOT gates. Uh, some examples are the Pauli X and C NOT gate. I represent the unitary operations of these quantum gates on qubits as rotations around a block sphere. And combinations of quantum gates can perform operations on qubits, which are com composed into quantum circuits, similar to how one would compose a classical circuit uh, using classical gates. Um, now, moving on to quantum computing and chemistry, um, chemistry is one of the near-term applications of quantum computing. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that it's better to use a, a quantum computer that has quantum properties to perform computations in a quantum system. And the reason why we perform simulations is to understand physical pro problems, of course, to create new theories, to explain these problems and to predict what will happen if similar problems are repeated, and to also explain um, unexpected results. Um, computational chemistry is a large field. For most of the talk, I'll be talking about quantum chemistry in particular, in which researchers are trying to model atomic interactions as accurately as possible using the Schrodinger equation. Now, the energy sector is one of the important sectors of chemistry that we believe will be impacted by quantum computing because the world's demand for energy is growing at a dramatic pace. Uh, more research is needed to discover alternative energy sources, including batteries. And to cut the story short, we believe that quantum computing could play a pivotal role in this space because it may be possible for quantum computing to enhance the types of simulations that we can perform on some of the processes that occur in batteries because they are really complex, complicated processes that classical computers cannot really deal with at the moment. Um, so we believe that quantum computing could improve our ability to make more accurate predictions. Right, and if I if I understand correctly, uh, it's mostly about, or at least in part about, better simulating molecules, right? Because we like obviously to create a new material, we first need to create a new molecule, and to create a new molecule, you have to have this configuration of atoms arranged in a specific way, right? And uh, is, is that is that uh, if you can explain, like from because you're obviously the chemistry expert, uh, <laughs> how, how exactly it works? Like, how can you find this perfect molecule for your new material and why quantum computers are better in that task than, you know, classical ones? Well, um, you know, I, I mentioned quantum chemistry and I will grossly understate things by saying that it's very complicated. <laughs> um, there are many types of uh, simulations that we can perform. I mean, if, even normal chemistry is quite complicated, right? Yes, I'm it's sure. very complicated as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, quantum chemistry is just another order of complication about that. Um, so there are many types of simulations that we can perform, and we can obtain answers that will allow us to make assumptions based on the results that we generate, we can form hypotheses, we can innovate based on these hypotheses. But um, quantum chemistry as practiced today on the classical computers also struggles with many problems. And this has mostly to do with the accuracy of the quantum chemistry methods and how, and how easily we can actually carry out these simulations. Uh, for example, one of the most widely used methods that we use is uh, density functional theory or DFT, but we have to carefully evaluate the accuracy of DFT methods by benchmarking and this is time consuming and there's no really reliable way to improve your results in addition um, some methods may be may not accurately simulate chemical species with exotic electronic structures such as radicals bioradicals and so on with unpaired electrons and these are normally generated in batteries um, dft methods are not universally accurate uh, in order to characterize the electronic structures of these uh, species, we like to use uh, more accurate methods, such as wave function methods, to study these types of systems, but they can be very expensive in terms of the memory required, the amount of space required, um, the amount of time required for the computation. And uh, we believe that quantum com computing could help us by allowing us to perform such types of electronic stretch calculations or wave function uh, calculations more efficiently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know, that's, uh, that's a great explanation. Thank you for that, Gavin. Um, and of course, you know, as you mentioned, uh, all, all these simulations are, are super important for new materials and in our, for like, you know, for our discussion today, uh, for new batteries, right? And, and with that, uh, let me go to Theo now uh, and Theo, like, what's, what's your view? Why, why do we need new batteries? I mean, Gavin kind of touched upon that already, obviously, but uh, I would really love to hear uh, what, what you think. Why is it that you guys are actually working so hard to create new batteries for the world? I mean, we already have batteries, right? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. But the reality is that uh, uh, we need really for different reasons. And uh, one of those, one of the, I, I think, most important one um, that may not necessarily be um, of relevance for electric mobility is the fact that we need uh, battery technology that is also capable of absorbing uh, uh, the energy that is produced with the sustainable uh, renewable sources. Uh, these are very uh, uh, fluctuating sources of energy. The sun one day shines, the other day it's cloudy, you have strong winds one day and no winds for a week. And we need to be able to absorb that energy and store it for when the, the, the society really needs it. On the other hand, we need to if we now look more at the consumer good market, like electrical mobility. It's crucially important to uh, push the technology to, uh, let's say, advance more and more uh, the uh, experience of driving an electric car. Uh, we know that, I mean, with, uh, uh, there are different reasons for that, of course. I mean, one, one is also when, when, when I started working on the battery fields, and uh, Katia, this goes back a little bit of times ago, like uh, uh, 12 years ago, uh, we started, the, we initiated a project at IBM that was called Battery 500. And we, we really uh, put lots of effort in uh, exploring new technologies, uh, mostly metal air batteries uh, that may have been uh, uh, actually very good candidate for uh, creating that gap uh, that would have really provided more value and a better experience for people driving electric mobility. And, uh, of course, you do that for different reasons. I mean, one is the primary experience of a, of a person driving a car and not having the anxiety uh, of thinking that uh, the battery is going to uh, to discharge quickly and you will be in the middle of nowhere. So uh, basically elongate the range. But we also need to do that for, for other reasons because uh, there are so many other sectors as I said, electrical mobility is a very important one. It's one that I do care personally. Uh, so I, I really, I'm a strong supporter of uh, electrical mobility. Uh, but if we think to other types of technologies, like uh, even semiconductor technologies, there have been a very fascinating projects even within IBM, uh, where we were trying to understand whether the replacement uh, of uh, specific wiring inside the semiconductor may have been possible through the use of uh, uh, specific liquids. At the time, we were talking about uh, electric plug. An electric bulb is nothing more than a liquid that is carrying out uh, electricity and then uh, using a concept which is semi sem very similar to, this, to the concept of, of a battery uh, extracting the energy out of the fuel for powering the electronics. So I, I think, I mean, there are so many levels in our society from consumer goods to uh, uh, infrastructure works, uh, thinking to a stabilization of grid and uh, storage of uh, renewable sources, but even all the way to miniaturization and uh, semiconductor, where the further development for battery materials is something that we cannot ignore anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. We can't ignore it for sure. And uh, also for IBM specifically, it's such a huge uh, topic, right? A uh, huge field of research that I, I think last year we even had it on our like uh, five and five uh, list of predictions. So prediction that we think is going to come true within the next five years. Is that is that right, yeah? Absolutely, absolutely. The energy was one of the five predictions and uh, uh, 
for people that may not be aware what is 5in5, and maybe I may also ask the colleagues if they want to uh, paste the link of the 5in5 five five of uh, uh, 2020. Uh, it's a bet that we do as IBM research on technology, on fields of technology, uh, where in the next five years there will be a revolution. And last year it was about materials. Materials they may have had an impact on technologies that are relevant for sustainable goals. Uh, I also, I, I loved a lot 2020, irrespective of the pandemic and all the situations that happened worldwide, because it was the year for the UN Sustainable Goals. And so we had uh, really a very strong drive, even in uh, analyzing the patterns and identifying the five main themes where uh, the development of novel materials may dramatically change uh, the technology, the situation of the technology, and the energy is there. And energy was there uh, as uh, uh, development of materials for batteries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. Uh, and uh, we, we now have uh, questions coming in actually from the audience, and there is one for Gavin. Uh, so somebody here is asking, looks like um, if, if, if any one of us wanted to actually simulate chemical reactions in batteries using the IBM quantum tools right now, what are the current IBM quantum computers actually capable of, Gavin? Uh, sure, um, so um, as I mentioned, most of the efforts uh, in quantum simulations for chemistry has been on using quantum chemistry. We have had uh, some degree of success, but there's still a lot of work to do. Um, so we've developed uh, several error mitigation techniques, such as those designed to deal with uh, device v dot error, those to perform noise extrapolations and so on. Uh, we've also developed strategies to reduce the number of qubits required to simulate larger molecules. For example, exploiting symmetry, use of frozen cores, use of active spaces for reactions. Um, we have uh, generate we have created new onsets that can be um, used to actually do these uh, simulations on quantum simulators as well as on quantum hardware. Um, we've created uh, new, uh, we've used near-term variational algorithms such as uh, VQE or variational quantum eigensolver to perform hybrid simulations partly done on classical hardware and partly done on quantum hardware or with quantum simulators. But there are uh, many challenges and these mainly have to do with the development of better quantum algorithms, development of better uh, hardware. Um, some of the main challenges um, are that we need to develop and use uh, better quantum algorithms, as I mentioned. At present, because we have a limited number of noise qubits, uh, we're dependent on quantum algori algorithms like VQE, in which you run a quantum circuit hundreds, if not thousands of times in order to perform statistics and obtain a final energy. Um, there are other algorithms that have been developed for chemistry, like phase estimation, but they require too many qubits or they require the ability to operate on deep quantum circuits, which is not something that we're capable of doing today. Um, we have a limited number of noise qubits, but we, because of these limitation, this limitation, we try to limit the number of qubits that we're actually using as much as possible because the, the error increases with the increase while increasing the number of qubits that you're using. So at present, we can only perform cal calculations on small chemical systems, or we study systems in which we limit the number of orbitals being used in order to map onto fewer qubits. We also limit the size of the basis set, which describe the atomic orbitals to a limited set in order to reduce the number of qubits and gates needed. So in general, the development of better quantum hardware and or, um, error mitigation techniques or fully fault tolerant uh, uh, qubits would help. Um, right now, we um, interface with quantum computers in the cloud. Um, in the future, we hope that uh, quantum computing would work right alongside classical computing for chemistry pro problems so that it would be um, even easier for us to actually use uh, the, the quantum computers that we have. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, by the way, I, I, I can't help but uh, comment. Uh, 
Uh, you're talking about all this super cool futuristic stuff and, and you're joining us from your bedroom which is which is quite amazing but uh, you know it's such a norm right right now right like people are just working from home and uh, even if you're working on <laughs> quantum applications and, and really amazing stuff as you as you mentioned through the cloud of course so you can <laughs> yes. access your uh, quantum computers through the cloud you don't have to actually be anywhere else right now right right right, right. <laughs> um but um what, what okay. you were just talking about right now, actually, you kind of answered the question um, that that's been sent to me now uh, for, for you from uh, Ayu Zhang, uh, who is asking: the current quantum computer is still NISC. How to apply this kind of device with limited size and error to real applications? So maybe you could just summarize. Um, well, first of all, what NISC is, but you kind of answered that already. But maybe just to simplify a little bit for the audience who are maybe um, not not so uh, don't have you know so much expertise in, in uh, quantum computing terminology yes yeah, so so NISC uh, stands for um, uh, this refers to these near-term computers that we're using today so these are uh, quantum computers that are limited in number of qubits and are also noisy and um, as, as uh, Kelly mentioned yes I did answer a lot of this already so we've we've uh, tried to implement a lot of techniques to deal with the noise that we have. We try to limit the number of qubits. Uh, we try to uh, develop uh, error mitigation techniques and use them while we're doing all these uh, um, simulations in order to, to, to um, more accurately simulate the, the systems that we're interested in. Great, great. And, you know, as, as we mentioned uh, earlier, right, so, uh, and and you keep repeating it, so we, we, we are using these quantum computers for molecular simulations. Uh, and we will be using them, you know, more in the future when they uh, they will be working better than classical ones, specifically for molecular simulations to create better materials and hopefully better batteries in our case. But at the moment, we are not quite there yet. Uh, so today we have to rely on today's technology, right? And uh, now with that, uh, I'd like to go back to Theo because that's exactly where your work comes in, right? Because you work on, on AI and uh, how can AI help us, um, you know, with creating a new battery, a better battery right now, today? Uh, absolutely. Before I jump into the AI topic, there is one thing that I wanted to comment on uh, uh, what mentioned by Gavin. It's a very exciting field uh, because to a certain extent we are experimenting exactly uh, what quantum chemistry was experimenting 30 years ago when we still didn't have the computational power that we have today. And so we are really trying to adapt algorithms uh, and grow and adapt the algorithms with the uh, growth of the corresponding hardware. Uh, I think it couldn't be a more exciting time for people that are developing software, for people that are uh, thinking how to apply uh, the, the physical schemes on uh, on hardware, so it's uh, it's really a very fascinating time. And uh, now, following on your question, AI, uh, of course, I mean uh, we start from a different perspective, uh, the perspective of the data. And uh, I think, I mean, uh, uh, I'm I'm actually here in the lab, and I, I'm apologizing for all the people that are listening. If there is a little bit of background noise, it's truly live with. Uh, operations in the autonomous lab um, but the AI is really uh, in the last years uh, really got a very important role in the space of material design uh, we have been using AI for collecting information we have been using AI for building models that were capable of uh, uh, predicting uh, new material hypotheses that's at the end is uh, is one of the main uh, uh, advantage of uh, machine learning and data-driven models. Uh, reasoning on data, extracting patterns for data, identifying the correlation, and using those signals to support the domain expert in producing new type of materials for battery application. Uh, AI is also doing something else though, and that's really uh, very important. It helps us in synthesizing those materials. And that's the reason why I'm here today. Uh, the, the space where, where, where I'm broadcasting from is actually uh, the first autonomous lab connected in the cloud, uh, reachable through internet. It's really an embodiment, a chemical laboratory embodied in, uh, in the cloud. So 
having said that, we, we really talked a little bit about uh, the use of AI in the technology stack. And uh, uh, AI is really helping to accelerate a different stage of the research. And this is what uh, we actually in IBM uh, uh, call accelerated discovery. Uh, we are taking a big advantage of AI, but also of quantum uh, and uh, cloud, different type of uh, technologies to accelerate the research and be able to design new materials with a 10 X factors on time and cost. So this is really the objective of the accelerated discovery. Uh, reduce as much as possible the trial and error to be able to design new materials, better materials, faster and uh, uh, with a more precise uh, uh, specification on, on possible potential. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There is another space that I believe uh, uh, a little bit more disconnected from AI, it's a little bit more general. And I think that that will be another sector where we will be observing a lot uh, the use of AI. Uh, I think in, uh, in mostly all uh, modern electric vehicles, uh, there are uh, systems of uh, artificial intelligence for managing the battery packs. So that's really very important. I mean, real time, uh, data analysis of all the sensors that are in that battery packs that really allow to calibrate the use of the pack and again improve uh, the experience for the people. So AI is having a humongous role uh, for what is basically most relevant for me, for us that are talking about research in, in the design of new materials, but uh, it will have really incredible implication on uh, how complex battery infrastructure uh, are going to be easily handled in the future. Uh, it's very similar, if I can make a last parallelism, um, to uh, the fly-by-wire concept. Uh, why did people introduce the fly-by-wire? Because there is a lot of complexity in handling uh, uh, unstable design of aircraft, and you really need to rely completely on computer. And here in this case, Whenever you start putting together different battery packs, so we are talking about the technology, but we are talking also about all the, 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 the package that is taking care of the cooling of the battery, how much power you can drain out of the battery, uh, and how much power you can even inject in the battery, uh, the system starts to be incredibly complex. And of course, it's beyond the human capabilities to handle the complexity and it's there where AI uh, can come and help. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, um, so you kind of mentioned uh, that you're in, in, um, in your AI lab right now, but uh, I think what you haven't done yet is actually named the machine that's doing all this amazing work, right? Uh, you're, you're next to it, aren't you? So maybe you could introduce us to your robotic helper oh, there and uh, what it does exactly. Absolutely, it's uh, it's really a pleasure. So the environment that you see behind me is actually uh, what we label RoboRxN. Uh, RoboRxN itself is not something physical. It's uh, it's really a blending of three technologies. We have AI, we have cloud, and we have uh, uh, commercial automation hardware. Behind me, you can see the third component, the commercial automation hardware, together with uh, uh, analytical instruments here uh, on my. Uh, on my left. Uh, so RoboRxN was really the extension of the work that we did and that we named uh, in 2018 uh, IBM RxN for Chemistry. Is, uh, the, the, the primary goal of that activity is the extension, the use of natural language processing technologies uh, to domain specific languages. And in our case, chemistry. So we have been uh, really demonstrating like you can use the same architecture that we routinely, daily use for translating between uh, uh, English and Spanish or Italian or Japanese and use exactly the same technology, train those architecture with chemical data to uh, support the chemist in uh, design synthesis, in uh, synthesizing uh, new materials. And in this lab, we are strongly specialized on small organic molecule. And while most of the battery application is actually solid state, so we are not really 
talking about organic molecules, here instead we can design and synthesize molecules that can really make a difference for uh, uh, energy storage device like uh, uh, electrochemical flow cells uh, that are very relevant and very important for large scale application. So it's possible to synthesize uh, materials that uh, uh, molecules that have specific redox potential and then optimize the difference in redox potential in such a way to maximize uh, the output voltage of the entire technology. And here I think we are streaming some of the images uh, out of uh, a sample of a chemical synthesis that we have been doing uh, for one of these uh, small molecules in the context of semiconductors, but the images are uh, pretty similar. So very interesting technology. Uh, uh, again, even if uh, highly tailored for small organic molecules, but very relevant even for optimizing large scale energy storage devices that may have a very relevant application for, for the grid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember uh, you uh, not so long ago, you even uh, created a molecule uh, live in front of a live audience, right? Uh, uh, at, the, at the shore of the Zurich Lake. So um, oh, if people want to want to watch Teo do that, so Google uh, something like, you know, Teo IBM Research uh, Molecule Life, and uh, I'm sure you'll come across the YouTube video and uh, it, it was quite quite a show. It was quite amazing. <laughs> Absolutely, God, yeah. It was... Uh, the time we were streaming by the Lake of Zurich, this time I decided to stream from the lab. Um, it's, uh, it's really the uh, final concept of uh, providing, uh, even to chemists, an home office uh, uh, opportunity. You can do chemistry from uh, uh, the sofa and the comfort of your, of your apartment. Yeah, absolutely. Before we go to the questions from the audience, there are quite a few that are waiting now. Um, I'd like to ask you, Gavin, actually, what, what uh, your thoughts are on RoboRxN and specifically like on, on AI uh, more generally, actually. How, do you think in the future quantum computing can help uh, or actually not help, but, you know, wor work alongside AI to together these two technologies kind of accelerate our um, research of new materials for, for batteries even, even more? What do you think? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, first of all, I think uh, RoboRxN is, is very cool. Um, I'm a trained chemist, and I actually think that a lot of uh, that, that I see in AI and machine learning, especially for chemistry, is, is almost like magic. Um, I know a lot of my uh, experimental chemistry colleagues at, at Almaden, where I work, um, were very excited to see the RoboRxN demonstration and like, what it could mean for their research. And it was exciting for me as well. Um, I think a lot of my experimental chemistry uh, colleagues were excited about the fact that they could actually, as uh, Teo said, actually do experiments from home. So, um, which is perfect for the te the current times that we're in, right? Um, so, uh, but talking about the combination of AI and, and quantum computing, actually, we've already started to make progress on uniting quantum computing and machine learning for investigations of materials. Uh, in particular, we deployed uh, quantum machine learning to assist classical DFT methods in a study of uh, disordered crystalline materials used on lithium ion batteries. Uh, we've also used neural networks to improve the precision of, uh, of observables for chemical systems to arrive at more accurate results. So these examples highlight the pathways that one could take when um, leveraging AI and quantum computing for chemistry. So using machine learning to improve quantum algorithms or and or uh, using uh, quantum machine learning to improve one classical results. Right, right. Um, well, here is a question for you, Gavin, uh, from the audience here. I, I don't have the name this time. Um, I'm sure you all are not the only ones researching the use of quantum and AI for applications on batteries. Really? Well, I hope you're not. <laughs> anyway, do you have any stories of how you learn, you collaborate with other researchers on this topic? That's a good question. Uh, certainly. Um, so we um, we actually work with partners. So we um, so IBM. We we don't go. We're not on this path alone. We work with 
a number of partners and um, and typically what we depend um, on from these partners is that they come in with the subject matter expertise. So they're the ones who are coming in with projects and saying, hey, how can we actually use quantum computing to study this type of, 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 uh, of material or this type of system? And so we've we've partnered with, with um, with companies like Daimler, Mercedes-Benz, as well as um, K University, JSR, well, K, yeah, K University is a university, of course, JSR, Mitsubishi Chemicals, to actually study these types of systems. And, and typically they come in with a use case, and then we try to help them tailor what they're interested in to a quantum computer. Mm -hmm. And can you can you share any of the latest results maybe with any of these companies? I mean, how, how close are we to applications really? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, so we have, as I mentioned, we, we worked with um, Daimler Mercedes-Benz actually on the uh, project that I mentioned earlier um, uh, using um, QML for, um, for study of lithium ion crystalline materials. And we've also worked with them on lith lithium sulfur batteries. Uh, we've also collaborated with Mitsubishi Chemical and K University, located in Japan, uh, on the research involving um, lithium uh, O2 batteries, where there we were looking at uh, a, a reaction that's proposed to occur in lithium air batteries. Um, of course, we're also working with other partners on other topics in chemistry and physics. For example, we worked with Mitsubishi Chemical, um, K University, and JSR on simulations of materials for OLED applications. Um, so we believe that uh, partnerships like these are very valuable, as I mentioned, because um, the 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 part the, the the partner comes in with the subject matter expertise and challenges us to actually um, be able to study these uh, systems on com quantum computers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and uh, so you mentioned uh, lithium. Uh, so basically. I guess my question is, are you mostly trying to kind of improve the current lithium ion batteries or are you trying to move away from lithium ion completely and create something completely new? Uh, we're trying to to do all, everything, basically. <laughs> um, that is, well, that is, of course, our, our goal. That's the goal of research, right? Is to, to be able to um, improve the things that we have now, as well as to actually um, uh, look at some new areas that could potentially offer us um, a new pathway or new technologies that we can actually iterate on and can actually improve the things that we're working on right now. Right. And uh, uh, Theo, uh, wh what do you think about lithium ion? Like why, what, what's what's wrong with, you know, current lithium ion batteries right now anyway? Yeah, let me also follow up first, I mean, on, uh, on, on, on the question that was coming from the audience. There beyond, I mean, uh, the uh, very relevant, very important collaboration with uh, industrial partner. Uh, we also have stories uh, within uh, governmental funded projects. So an example here in Switzerland for people that may be aware of that is uh, uh, the Marvel uh, Center for uh, uh, Research, basically, where we have been uh, really using uh, in the last uh, uh, seven years uh, AI uh, resources and technology to design new cathode materials, new anode materials uh, within a specific type of technology. So I think it's uh, it's a very, very interesting. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, beyond even the one that I'm mentioning, uh, if we go across the entire uh, research unit, we will find very amazing stories of collaboration in this space of factories. As I yeah. said, it's, uh, it's really a 10 years plus um, Belief that we have uh, in uh, uh, novel materials that can change uh, the landscape of storage devices. And why do we need to do that? Uh, let me connect to your question about the lithium, uh, lithium technology. Uh, there is nothing really bad about lithium. In reality, we have uh, a, very, a very solid network of uh, recycling for lithium. Uh, however, uh, I mean, the, the current the current trend, the current uh, uh, extrapolation. If we really extrapolate to uh, to an entire humanity relying on uh, electrical uh, energy storage devices, uh, one of the main concerns is really availability of lithium. 
And so it's really important to explore different type of technologies. There will never be one battery that fits all type of problem and all type of application. This is something that we will have really to uh, to uh, to realize and live with that. Uh, I'm. We were discussing Katia initially about uh, uh, battery application for battery for grid application. These type of batteries are completely different from the batteries that are running in electric vehicles. In an electric vehicles. Uh, we want to have uh, reusability, we want to have uh, rechargeability, and we want to have uh, even a larger number of cycles. Now, to a certain extent, lithium, lithium technology made it really possible. It made it possible in terms of uh, uh, gravimetric energy density, uh, and this basically means uh, with the same weight, we are carrying an amount of energy that even if less than the one uh, that uh, a liter of gasoline may be producing, is still uh, pretty much comparable in the overall economy of the energy conversion in uh, uh, in a piston engine. Uh, but there are other technologies. I mean, uh, we have been looking at sodium. We have been looking uh, uh, at uh, other metals uh, providing the really the source, the main energetic drive. I think it will be important to have uh, a specific differentiation where we are really identifying different technologies for the specific use. And uh, different technology and different type of materials for the specific use. And there, the importance of using AI, the importance of uh, using quantum for calibrating, optimizing uh, the material design, uh, quite often can make a big difference in terms of uh, uh, several uh, equivalents of uh, megawatt hours of energy that are stored in a device. Yeah. Yeah, um, sure. So I'd, I'd like to, uh, yeah, I'd like to just interject here. So yeah, first of all, yes, I agree with Matteo. Um, so some of the other, some some um, important reasons, as, as some of them that Tate mentioned, is of course abundance of lithium as a natural resource. There's a finite amount of lithium available. It's worthwhile to look for an alternative battery material. For example, sodium, as Tia mentioned, is widely abundant. It's a lot cheaper. Um, moreover, in some cases, the, uh, the technology used for lithium batteries rely on other natural resources. For example, cobalt, which are obtained in problematic ways. So they're in conflict zones, for example. And if we can create batteries that um, that don't rely on such such materials, then it would be better for us all, I believe. Um, there's also um, a possible, possibility of creating safer batteries. So safety is also another um, important concern here as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I totally agree. And uh, actually, important question here from, from the audience, uh, which we probably should have addressed uh, a little bit earlier, but you know, better late, late than, than never. Uh, H. Lander is asking, what actually describes the battery of the future? And is it just an accumulator, so reloadable, or uh, just a battery that is like gone after draining? So what's your view? Uh, I'll, uh, I'll pass it over to Tia. You, you have... <laughs> well, I, 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 I want to remark what I said before. Uh, there is not going to be the battery of the future. There are going to be batteries of the future. What we need to do, and this is the responsibility of science and research, is really push all the technology uh, to the level where we are uh, really achieving a very high level of uh, um, gain in terms of uh, energy stored and very little losses. So I, I, I was thinking when, when Katya, you were reading this question, I, I don't know why, it, it came to my mind uh, uh, that thermonuclear batteries that we use in satellites. This type of batteries or in, uh, in, uh, in, in rover that are exploring other planets on behalf of humans, these batteries are going to be there. And uh, because they offer a certain number of uh, reliability and uh, uh, independence that different type of technologies are not really capable of offering. But this is really only one example. We will have battery that will be specifically optimized for electrical mobility. We will have battery that will be 
optimized for grid application where actually there is not too much pressure and stress on the number of cycles that you can achieve. Because normally when, when you talk about batteries for mitigating the grid or absorbing a, a surplus of energy produced by renewable sources, you are really, you should really picture like huge containers, uh, uh, thousands and thousands of liters of solutions. Uh, these are the electrochemical flow cells uh, where you are actually storing the excess energy. And whenever needed, this is actually released, but you are not doing the same type of use um, that you do with batteries and electrical mobility, where maybe you are charging today, discharging in three hours, and then recharging again in four hours. So there will not be one battery, but there will be many batteries. And uh, I think our role is really the one of uh, uh, being uh, sure and uh, that, that the technology like AI and quantum are really used for uh, improving the design of the materials for each technology. Yeah, for sure. And of course, uh, as you mentioned, I mean, storage is super important for uh, renewables, right? Because obviously when we've got solar panels or, or wind turbines, uh, you're not gonna like we do have to store that energy for longer even during the night or when there's no wind right so we shouldn't be dependent on the weather conditions and we are right now so um so that's that's all super important i i totally agree um here is a question from akhil kara for for gavin i guess um and akhil is saying are there any new tools under development especially with respect to quantum computing that will help simplify and speed up quantum chemistry and computational chemistry research? Uh, yes, that's a good question. Um, so uh, at IBM, we're always trying to make um, make the tools that we're using and the tools that we're, um, what we're offering to the wider public as, as um, to make it as, as easy for our users as possible. And yes, so um, we're also we're always trying to make improvements to um, the the main software that we use, which is called Qiskit, so that a lot of it that um, that users are exposed to, like application researchers are exposed to, um, will be abstracted away from the the, the user. Um, also, if you are interested in, say, not only um, uh, working on applications and quantum computers say to um, improve battery research or so on. Um, then you could also look at things like, um, if you're interested in say making better qubits, they could look at Qiskit Metal. So we, we have a lot of tools that we're, we're trying to actually um, implement that will make things use, easier for users to actually use the, the tools that we have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that, Gavin. And here is a question about recycling from uh, from the audience here, uh, which is actually a, a really uh, important aspect as well that we haven't really talked about much yet. Um, so Charles Gu is asking, is there any fundamental change of batteries technology? What about recycling? How to save the weight in order to use battery in aviation industry? So I guess it's several questions in one, uh, but um, Theo, maybe you could talk uh, talk to us about recycling specifically for now Absolutely. and then address aviation. This this question is just uh, touching me on my most interest, which is not recycling but aviation actually. So, uh, <laughs> of course, so, because you you fly, right? You're a pilot. Well, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Exactly. Uh, so let me let's first start addressing a fundamental change of battery technologies. Um, there have been in the last ten years a very uh, I would say uh, important uh, attention by many companies, including us, uh, to metal air uh, technologies. I would really say uh, that this technology is, at least on paper, it's actually the one that can uh, uh, deliver an incredibly competitive uh, gravimetric uh, and I'm always referring to weight for a reason. I'm, I'm arriving there um, compared to uh, the fuel that we are burning in piston engine. Um, there are some difficulties, however, uh, and this is more or less uh, uh, where I personally, uh, from my perspective, I, I really left the field of uh, uh, metal air batteries. 
uh, one of the side products in this process is really the formation of uh, uh, substances that are highly oxidizing. We are talking about uh, peroxides, superoxides. And the reason is that uh, one of the other, one element is the metal that you are carrying with you. But the other element is the oxygen that is in the air. And that's the beauty of this concept. You don't need to care the anode and the cathode, actually, or the anode and the cathode material. But one of the two, the oxygen that is in the air, is directly available. And you don't, doesn't really contribute to the weight that you are carrying. There, there are, however, as I said, important uh, uh, challenges. And one of those that we have been looking for several years uh, in, in a period where AI was not yet there, unfortunately, um, was the stability of the electrolytes. You always need a medium for diffusing the ion and, uh, and, and closing the cell. Uh, most of the electrolytes are organic molecules. And one of the main complexity was really to identify stable electrolytes they may have undergo to a specific number of cycles. In general, for use application, we are talking about several hundreds, if not a thousand cycles during the life uh, uh, time of the battery uh, without really degrading. And uh, this unfortunately didn't really happen. And I think there is always a lot of research. The interest for metal oxygen batteries, of course, is shifting towards solid state concept so you are completely getting rid of the uh, organic electrolytes to have instead uh, uh, the presence of uh, a solid state electrolyte with uh, huge benefits in terms of uh, chemical and uh, uh, electrochemical stability so these are some of the i would say uh, forefront technologies uh, nothing that, unfortunately, we will be able to consume tomorrow, uh, maybe in a few years. Uh, it's always the big question mark, are we going to make uh, that technological discovery that is going suddenly to make uh, the entire uh, technology usable? In the lab, metal air batteries are amazing and are one of the still well thought uh, and uh, always uh, uh, considered ideas to promote uh, mobility in aviation, so electrical aviation. And there we are going to the second part of the question. Uh, what do we really need? Well, we need light batteries. We need really batteries that uh, uh, are competitive in terms of uh, gravimetric uh, and volumetric energy density in an airplane. It's important also the volumetric components because the wings, which is normally where we are storing fuel, uh, the wings of the airplane have a fixed volume. So you want to maximize also uh, the, volumetric, uh, the volumetric density. Normally with the design of the cars, the volumetric density is important, but you can always play a little bit increasing the volume of the car, making a car a little bit bigger uh, and the, the, the stronger focus is really on gravimetric density. In the case of airplanes, instead, the two are playing, both of them, a very important role. One, because the volume is normally pretty well defined, and the second, because the weight is going to have a very important component. If you are too heavy, you are not uh, taking off from a runway. Uh, in all that, and I will close it here, recycling. It's an important component of every battery technology. Um, we, we, we are talking a lot about sustainable goals. But when we talk about sustainable goals, it also means that uh, uh, all these technologies that are not necessarily, uh, how to say, uh, renewable in principle, because we are, we are taking uh, resources, land resources, we're taking lithium, we're taking other minerals for building the batteries. We have to act in a very responsible way. And the amazing things uh, for lithium-ion batteries is that after roughly 30 years of uh, consumer uh, consumption by the people, we have in place, I don't have really the last digits at my availability, but we have in place a mechanism, a chain of recycling that can actually recycle more than 95, 97% of the batteries. Uh, that's, uh, that's really 
where we have to aim and ideally even push the number the number higher. Are we are we working on any of that? Uh, somebody is actually asking whether you guys are, are doing any research that could lead to uh, more kind of easily recyclable batteries. So regarding recyclability, one of the main components uh, beyond the material, the material itself is really defining uh, the performance, the electrochemical performance, but the recyclability and how easy it is to recycle is really a packaging problem. Normally is, uh, is an engineering problem. And it's there that AI comes to uh, our hands. We have uh, uh, some projects that we are incubating uh, inside our research lab where we are using AI to drive the design of uh, uh, packaging and and user product. Not only the, the, the design of the materials, the chemical composition or the formulation, but really how you should assemble uh, your uh, your consumer goods in order to maximize specific properties. This is a very interesting concept for AI-aided design of, uh, uh, of products in semiconductor industry, but also in the uh, energy storage domain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for that, uh, Theo. And just a very last uh, question here, uh, probably very short, but important for the audience. Somebody is asking where uh, they can actually go and experiment with quantum computers today uh, and uh, with RoboRxN. So if you guys can point our, our viewers here to, to the right direction to, you know, play around with Qiskit. And uh, I don't know if it's possible to do anything with RoboRxN, but let us know. Gavin? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the IBM computers are accessible through the cloud. Um, if you go to um, quantum computing, IBM.com. Today you can sign up for an account. You can start playing around with um, IBM quantum computers. You can start learning more about um, quantum computing. Um, and so this is uh, this is some this is a resource that uh, that is open for for everyone and everyone can use it today. Fantastic. And I I, I want to stress the appeal for for Kicksuit. Also an, an, an appeal to all the quantum chemistry or computational chemistry that are in the audience, uh, take the initiative and uh, start really uh, experimenting with the uh, early technology, early quantum computing technology is going to be uh, an incredible investment also for uh, career prospects. I mean, we should learn by the history. And as I said at the beginning, this period is resembling a lot uh, what I experienced only partially at the beginning of the 90s. Uh, so fantastic era. Regarding RoboRxN and RxN, all the models, we make available all the models. So if there are people that are interested in uh, chemistry, synthetic chemistry, how can you predict the outcome of a chemical reaction? Are you preparing yourself for chemistry classes? Uh, reach out IBM RxN for chemistry, uh, just Google and you will uh, land on the website and you can use the resources, the train model for uh, prepping your uh, chemistry class exam. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Theo. And, yeah. and thank you, Gavin. That was a fantastic session. I hope uh, our viewers enjoyed it as, as much as I did. And thank you for um, thank you to everyone for joining us today, of course, and to our stellar uh, team of scientists behind the scenes that were answering uh, questions in the chat. And if you guys have any comments, ideas, questions, uh, you can always find me, for example, on, on Twitter and send me uh, a question or whatever you like, uh, DM me. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and join us again next month. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.